And after the presentation, we will open it up to a short 15 minute question and answer session. Please post your questions in the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. And again, this is Daniel Jarrett of Infinite Campus. And uh, thank you for joining us today, Daniel. Thanks, Janessa, I appreciate the introduction. I'm going to share my screen. All right, do you see my slide deck? Yeah. Great. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about instrumenting or adapting in Infinite Campus, which is a large K-12 student information and learning management system for research, for education research specifically. Oh, again, I'm Dan Jarrett. I'm the head of learning science technologies at Infinite Campus, and you can get a hold of me at danieljarrett.com, infinitecampus.com, or you know, hit me up on, on LinkedIn. So today we're going to be talking about three specific areas. First, I want to motivate our work by talking about a paradigm shift in education research. I'd like to talk about some new use cases that Infinite Campus has specifically been working on over the past year or so, and talk about a roadmap for the future uh, in partnership with education practitioners and researchers and funders. And of course, we'll have time for questions at the end. So I was really struck by this website. It's called Open Syllabus. They're really great. They focus on higher education. They collect syllabi from across many universities and they add a whole bunch of metadata and they allow you to see with pretty high fidelity what texts are being assigned across universities or across departments and across time. And you know, here you could see that uh, you know, Princeton Economics has the great escape as the text that's been assigned most often over that time period. Well, that's great. This works because the syllabus data has been centralized and standardized. And the people who operate this website believe that it has high fidelity. Now, imagine you wanted to do that within the K-12 sector. You just simply couldn't do it. Curriculum data like this is not available at national scale or really at, at almost any scale at all. Data localization is just the name of the game in K-12 education. If you think about the capabilities of the US Department of Education, they fund education research. And the levers they have to move tend to be things like, well, it's funding, they'll fund specific research questions. And they have their own programs like uh, NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, that's an actual assessment, and Title I funds and things like that. If they want to collect data, if, if the US Department of Education wants to collect data at large scale, they can do so, but they do so with things like surveys, adding burden to education agencies, or they can mandate data reporting from the states. That takes a long time. That vertical reporting is simply months to years long. And so this concept of just getting national data is not really tractable. Uh, or if it is, it takes a lot of money and time. So, you, so the Institute for Education Sciences, part of US Department of Education, they are a little bit stymied. How do they build modern R&D infrastructure you could think of that as data science infrastructure, when the things they have are usually highly aggregated administrative data. And you know, by law, they can't even build their own student information system. Well, you could look at people like the, the states. What could, for instance, Wisconsin DPI do or Indiana Department of Education? They also have the capability to do research within the confines of their state, but they've got the same constraints. They're waiting for data to be reported up from their local education agencies to the state. So what this has led to is a is the inability of education to operate like other sectors. If you think about what medicine can do, they can have lots of concurrent trials happening at once. 
education doesn't really work like that. We don't have the amount of money and we don't have shared R&D infrastructure. And, you know, we don't really have the, the sort of academic industry funder partnerships that, for instance, the medic, a medical field has. Or if we do have it, it's at a much smaller scale. And so people like Mark Schneider, director of IES, says just really straightforwardly, we need to test more and fail fast. We know that failing in experimentation is normal and expected. We just want to fail quickly and cheaply and try many more things. And in this case, I think it's really important to point out that we need to get better at understanding conditions and circumstances, that is, contexts that increase the probability that some intervention will work specifically identifying interventions for identifiable sets of learners. This is basically the research enterprise in a nutshell, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. The problem, of course, is that we're not doing well on these national standardized tests. Mark has written, and you can see in a recent blog post, our national assessments of educational progress especially compared to peer countries, are not going in the way we want. We know that there are gaps in educational outcomes among different communities of students that are trending in the wrong direction. Here in Minnesota, the difference between kids of color and white kids is really stark. These are pr real problems, and we don't see ourselves getting better soon. Okay, let's talk a little bit about why. Part of the reason that education research can be slow is data availability and management. Of course, there are many other reasons too, but I want to focus on those. Districts and states who are the data owners of most administrative data, the constraints are that it's a single education agency, that it's administrative in nature. That means things like which kids are enrolled in which school, they're rostered into which courses, what's on their transcripts, things like that. If a state owns the data, they often will create large longitudinal data sets and combine the K-12 records with records from other agencies. I mean, this is great. You can get early childhood, K-12, post-secondary, and labor data all in a, the same database, like KY Stats is a good example here. But of course, the, the constraints are that it's a single state and getting that heavily lagged data can take a long time. On the complete other side of the spectrum, we have individual vendors, like Carnegie Learning is a great example here. These are often curriculum vendors who control the content that they're putting out there in the world, especially if it's a digital learning platform, then there's a large amount of control that the vendors have over their specific curricular objects or assessment objects. They can have national or international scale. That's much different. But there are constraints. One of them is that they are often course specific and that any experimentation or insights you get around that particular thing that they have control over is constrained to just that course or just that object. And you don't often have a lot of supporting details about context that, you know, I talked before about context plus interventions equals outcomes is sort of the framework of, of research. Administrative data, great at thinking about contexts. Uh, this learning data with vendor data, great about thinking about interventions, but it's not often that those two are together. One of the reasons that administrative data is shaped like it is, is because it goes into local education agency systems as operational data. Operations is one of the key use cases of education data. It's real time data in databases that allows a school system to function in a, just an everyday manner. You need to know if a kid is tardy or absent, that has to go into the system right away. If someone shows up and said that, you know, hey, I'm little Susie's mother and I want to pick her up from school, well, you need to look that up. You need to have real-time knowledge of who's allowed to drop off medicine or pick, pick a kid up. Operations is key. 
And what states have asked is for that data to be vertically reported up to the state education agency for compliance and funding. So it has to be really accurate counts. It has to be highly PII because the states need to know which kids are where. And, and this is key, it has to be cross vendor. That means vendors like us, student information systems, are all producing reports that are the same as each other because the states are mandating it. And so what this means is that there's some sort of lowest common denominator reporting because it, it's simply a, a legal mandate that LEAs, that is school districts, produce these reports. And so there's not the ability to innovate quickly on that sort of vertical reporting. And if the states do make changes, they have to get all vendors to play along, uh, which can simply take a while. So in this, uh, in this formula here of our, our research enterprise, we see that administrative data and learning data really should be together. If you want to do something at scale or you want to do something that is much closer to real time, you want both the contextual setting properties of administrative data and traditional student information systems, but you want the real time experimentation and scale of a digital learning platform that is learning data. They belong together, but it's hard to get them together. So what we've seen at Infinite Campus is that there really is this, this missing middle. What technologies are there that can stitch these two pots of data together in a way that has many more of the affordances that we want, but fewer of the constraints? And in part, we need to do so respecting the particular needs of some related but distinct sets of stakeholders. The first and you know, crucial one is practitioners within school districts, teachers, staff members, students and parents, people who are the focus of our entire education enterprise. The students need to learn. The research partners need to focus on questions that are the most salient. Um, they know where the frontiers of research are and the, frankly, they, they need to know what data exists and what the constraints are around it. Telling researchers what data exists is not simple because it needs to align to specific research questions and they've got all sorts of, of analytics metadata that they need around data types and how it's entered, uh, you know, patterns of missingness and things like this. And then finally, there needs to be interoperability from the ed tech use cases, people like us, that we have our own concerns about things like database performance. If you look at you know, a big customer of ours, like Clark County, Nevada, that's Las Vegas, they have a third of a million students and they need to enter attendance every period for every kid. So our database has to handle a third of a million new attendance uh, records every period, every day, well, at the same time, allowing big reports to be run, like report cards or automated attendance phone calls or, or things like that. So we care about things like uh, making sure that servers are really responsive. Right. So something we've seen over the past year or so is that funders are realizing that this research infrastructure and the sort of partnership between practitioners, researchers, and platforms should be making it into funding solicitations. Uh, so the Gates Foundation has been talking about, uh, in fact, they have been really good partners with us on funding shared research infrastructure. And they, you know, they're focusing on math, they're focusing on students of color or students from low income families, but they have been explicit in saying they want to instrument existing digital learning platforms. National Science Foundation has their mid-scale research infrastructure one and two solicitations, which specifically aim at cyber infrastructure for this middle ground of uh, bigger than a single research project, but you know smaller than a, a you know a telescope that goes into space, something in the middle. And Schmidt Futures has been uh, has been funding in addition to specific education for learning 
engineering, they've been funding uh, using these uh, these competitions. They've been funding digital learning platforms to do more formal experimentation. That idea of a competition was taken up by US Department of Education and IES is funding the X Prize here for uh, for new instrumentation of digital learning platforms to do education experimentation. So funders really do care about this. Mark Schneider even talked about wanting to fund an IES Center for Excellence in Education Data Sciences. That's great. I think that's an excellent idea. But he said as a caveat, IES is one place, especially where they can play a leadership role in education data science. But there are so many places where IES is not going to be the right place for state-of-the-art education research technologies to be built. And in this case, beyond the purview of government agencies altogether. That's because so much of data science is at the transactional operational data level. And that is exactly where we come in. I'm gonna give you a bit of a, a background on who we are and, and why this is doable at Infinite Campus. So Infinite Campus is a Minnesota-based privately held education technology company. We were founded in 1993 and we build a student information system a learning management system, and a student payment system for the US K-12 market. Our platform manages student and staff data for more than 2,100 local education agencies, and we serve more than 8 million students across 45 states. In fact, on that map, you can see that this education technology sector is highly localized. There are some states where we have uh, almost no presence and other states where we serve every uh, every student. And that's just because of the way sales work uh, here. Uh, we provide data collection and management services for six state education agencies. Um, and of those, we serve every school district in Kentucky, Nevada, Hawaii, and the Bureau of Indian Education. And that means that we are the only SIS for Native Hawaiian and American Indian serving schools. And our customers also hold the data of 22 million previously enrolled students. So that's a, a total of about 130 million student years of data that our product manages. And then we also store information about the people around those students, like teachers and staff, parents and guardians, and siblings. We have existing relationships with a highly heterogeneous set of student populations and education agencies at all levels. Uh, rural and urban districts all use Infinite Campus, including 15 of the Council of Great City Schools. And as you think about what ed tech can do as to improve education research, you can think of one of the issues is that urban districts are overrepresented in research. In part, it's because you get the most bang for your buck. You do one legal agreement, hopefully one data request, and then you can get a heterogeneous large set of students. Great. But that means that rural or maybe uh, less wealthy districts are going to be severely underrepresented. And one of the reasons to to do education research using infrastructure that already serves rural schools is to try to ameliorate the problem that we know exists. We want to make sure that today's underrepresented populations are better represented in the future. Okay. Student information systems are the system of record for micro data. That's transactional data collection. So school districts put data into our SIS and LMS to make communication easier between staff members and families, to make compliance and funding and accountability reporting easier, and also for trend analysis for continuous improvement. This is a lot of data. Uh, so for example, the concatenation of the teacher grade books just in Louisville, Kentucky for the past 15 years is 330 million 
homework, quiz, and test grades. And let's look at the breadth of data that schools collect. Infinite Campus is the data entry and storage system that creates the millions of database rows and terabytes of data that eventually will get aggregated and reported up to states and the federal government. But just for the local education agency perspective, they have to have really granular data. And in our system, not only is it granular, but it's linked and longitudinal and hierarchical data. It has stable identifiers. Uh, and we don't get rid of data. I'm going to come back to that uh, in a moment. The fact that these are linked and longitudinal means that you can, and in fact, I have written a query to find a kid's lockers. And you could say, find me a, a report of kid's lockers in hall A, but order the report by those students' next youngest siblings' GPA from the prior year. That's trivial to do with a database schema like what we operate. We don't use any data archiving or purging. And this is because we've invested in database performance. As you think about, so you know, if you're running an SIS or you're running an LMS, what we've seen is that one of the things that that vendors will often do for database performance is to archive data off. It's just a lot cheaper to run reports if there's less data there. And so they'll take previous years of data and put them in different database tables or different databases altogether. And that's fine for performance, but it's really bad for analysis. And it's hard to do education research if the data is not in the same location. So we invested a lot in database performance so that we could keep all data online at the same time and we put timestamps on all the data so that you could rewind time and you could see what did the data look like as of a specific timestamp in the past. So th this includes things like seeing how a school built its master schedule. Years ago, we've got all the course requests, the rostering constraints, and it's great. Uh, it also, importantly, it links granular daily actions with long-term outcomes like grade level matriculation or high school graduation. So I've already talked about use cases for education data. We talked a lot about local operational data and the state compliance data, but I'd like to talk now about another use case for education data that has just not been invested in as much, and that is data for school improvement. What we have done as a, an industry, as a research sector, is we have all kind of decided that data for compliance should be data for improvement because it is available. That's it. It's just because the states collect it, so we use it for research because it's easy. But it doesn't have to be that way. Data for compliance doesn't have to be data for improvement that we as a, an industry and as a research sector should figure out how to do data set building for compliant for improvement that doesn't have to follow the same structures that the compliance data sets have. And another reason that's important is because education data sort of has a, a bad rap because it's used for compliance and accountability so much and funding so much that often uh, people like teachers are legitimately afraid of how education data is going to be used because it has been used to judge them so often in the past. And we'd like to refocus this, to have the lens of school improvement with a different way of generating data, with a different way of using the data so that there's not this culture of fear around the, the data use. So this is what we're building. Infinite Campus has created a national, non-personally identifiable uh, data set of data for school improvement that's drawn from our customer base, local education, local operational data, and this national data set that Infinite Campus protects centrally, that we've built the pipes between those two data infrastructures. 
the national data set looks very different than what a state data set might look like. The state needs to have really specific people identified and specific actions because it's used for compliance and funding. We don't. We need to have something that is probabilistic or aggregated that is not PII. The state needs to have lots of vendors contributing to their system. We don't. We want a single vendor. And that means that's us. And that means we can iterate really quickly on the sort of data that's being quote unquote vertically reported into that national data set. And it is bi-directional. That means that when we find insights in the data, that we can push them back into the operational data stores that the districts are running. That means they can use them that day in instructional improvement. I'm gonna give you an example here. The early warning system that we've built recently, uh, that we, we rolled out in Kentucky first and have, have since gone uh, to a, a national uh, national infrastructure. That was the first use of this national infrastructure that I've been talking about. This is statewide now in Kentucky and Nevada, um, and, and we've sold to, to other places as well. And this is how it works. The individual infinite campus districts who own and protect their own data in the district databases, that they have current year data that is kids who are currently enrolled, and they've got this historic data. The historic data includes outcomes of whether the kids dropped out of school or not. And so we built an aggregation and anonymization step where we can bring historic data into our national data infrastructure, and we can construct just the traditional data science style models that we can uh, use all of the appropriate data science techniques for, for randomization. I mean, th this is basically um, just traditional data science work, but it's being done at an unusually large scale. I don't think that anyone has ever in the past been able to train statistical models on you know, 45 states worth of administrative data at one time. Once we have created this ensemble of, of trained models, we put those models behind an API. Again, this is all within our, our uh, secure data centers. And then every day, the current data from students. So if a student got a, a you know, missing assignment, bad grade on, on a test, they got, uh, or they didn't come to school or things like that. The next day, that information will have been used in risk assessment and through this, this automated model and the new risk scores being pushed back down into the school district so that the counselors who are using this to triage which students should they talk to, that those risk assessments are using up-to-date data. We have been working uh, over the past year or so building relationships with funders and researchers to think about not just the early warning system, but what are the other most important use cases that, uh, that we can think about. So Schmidt Futures is funding the University of Minnesota to embed visiting scholars at Infinite Campus. So we treat them like employees. You know, we've got a whole bunch of legal and security protections around that, but the researchers then will co-develop with us. Um, and I'll talk about this in a minute we developed protections for them academically so that they have academic freedom within this environment. The National Science Foundation is funding NORC at the University of Chicago to study COVID-related unfinished learning. And NORC and NSF care about a specific research question, that is, to what extent did COVID cause changes in learning and for whom and by how much? That's important. But what we care about is the ability to measure that, just the fact that you can have the right metrics in a way that can be measured using an SIS or an LMS, that is critical infrastructure that doesn't just have to be here during a pandemic. That's something that our customers should be able to use any time of the year. And hopefully we have no more pandemics. And so what we want out of this is to learn with NORC and with NSF to learn how to build that infrastructure 
so that we can deliver that just as part of Infinite Campus to our customers. The Gates Foundation is funding Teachers College at Columbia University to think about patterns of course taking. And, uh, and specifically, we are interested in, you know, okay, so IES just funded a study a few years ago in Mississippi, where they looked at patterns of course taking for math courses in especially high school, with the ACT math score near the end of high school being the target variable of interest. That's great. I mean, that was a good study. But in order to do that, they had to go through a, a huge process with Department of Education in Mississippi to standardize course uh, codes, to get the data. And I read that study and I thought, huh, you could do that in Infinite Campus with like four lines of SQL code. It's, it should not be, uh, we shouldn't be asking researchers to constantly reinvent the wheel when it comes to data manipulation. Character Lab, which is uh, Dr. Angela Duckworth's lab, um, and they think a lot about social emotional learning and, and plenty of other things too, but they've created survey instruments. One of them is called the Thriving Index. And they, just as part of their practice, um, ensure that those surveys go out to school districts. Well, Infinite Campus has a survey module, we have the ability to have our customers get survey instruments from a common location and give them to, um, to the, the people in the district, students, parents, staff. Normally, that, that sort of giving surveys to people, it goes through things like Google Forms or Qualtrics or some purpose-built education software. The problem is that there's no contextual data. It's the same old problem of you have an intervention and maybe good intervention data, or you have a survey and good survey data. But what about the contextual information? How do you know what grade level they're in, race or ethnicity, uh, any of the key demographics? Are you able to look at patterns of the answers in your survey by any of those, uh, those variables? So you either have to stitch the systems together or you ask people to volunteer their own information. It's a burden for anyone. What we have built is the ability for those surveys and the survey answers. They could be anonymous, but if they're not anonymous, they are linked automatically to information that's already in the SIS and the LMS so that our customers can see patterns in answers immediately, just out of the box, by those demographic factors. Or frankly, it could be anything else. You could do rates of missing assignments. Um, I'm not going to fully describe all of these, but I want to give you the ideas behind funders, research partners, and Infinite Campus as platform. That, that is the sort of thing we're building. But in order to do that, what we've had to build, and this is very real expenses, is different types of infrastructure, product and legal, data, and experimental. Within product and legal, it is crucial to understand the data ownership structures uh, at play here. Of course, we do not own the education data. The education agency owns their own data. And so anything we do as a company has to be within a clear product constraint that it is something that a student information system or a learning management system should be doing, that it, that's the reason that those education agencies procured our system. So it has to be very clearly linked to instructional outcomes in US K-12 schools. In addition, we have the ability to use this data within a very limited range, specifically for product improvement. And then within product improvement, there are some restrictions on when we can see PII and when we can't see PII. And so we've had to be very specific about what sort of product improvement we're doing. We, we can't just answer research questions for the fun of it. That's not our purpose. You're not legally allowed to do that. It has to be something that creates product enhancements that are specifically for educational use in our customer education agency classrooms. But of course, that's really good for researchers because it's an avenue of dissemination. You already are publishing, but here you've got automatic technology transfer 
back to a whole lot of classrooms. We serve as many schools as there are McDonald's restaurants in the United States. The other thing we've had to build is that when we work with research organizations, they have to have publication and intellectual property rights. So there's been a long but successful negotiation between what Infinite Campus wants and what these research organizations need. And the way that we've solved this is that the research organizations, that it is usually the, the academic freedom they need, that they create and own the literature review, hypotheses, pseudocode uh, and proof of concept code, evaluation metric definition, and the results of the evaluation metrics themselves. When I say pseudocode or proof of concept code, that is a pretty specific definition of generalizable code that's not tied to Infinite Campus in particular, but is something that is a contribution to the academic or record or the, the public good and that any vendor could use that for their own technical roadmap. That's something that would be published. Uh, the, the researchers need that. What we do then at Infinite Campus is we see what they have created, and we create something called a reference implementation, which is our own software engineers operationalizing that proof of concept to work with our customer base, our code base, our database. And because we paid for that to be built, we, we own it. We can use it for, uh, for product improvement, and we do. But we commit to the researchers that we are going to instrument our system to produce the metrics that are needed to, uh, to it's the evidence that researchers need for their publication. And so it's this two-way commitment that has worked well. From the data side, what we've built is within this national data warehouse, we've built near real-time data transfer between infinite campus districts and some external data sets into centralized protected infrastructure. Again, we own our own data centers. It's then in this sort of big data technology. It's basically anonymized tables of information. That is highly locked down. Um, almost no person should ever have access to that sort of information, but we protect it mechanistically so that some uh, computational scripts can have access to it. And those scripts have, they create something called data products. It's basically rectangular data sets that a researcher would want. And we put privacy controls around that. Uh, we do a whole lot of student data privacy controls, um, like k-anonymization, uh, differential privacy, and so on, to ensure that the, the data that comes out cannot be re-identified. The, uh, let's see, I want to get to questions real quick here. So the, the last thing I want to bring up is that it's important, of course, that experimentation be a core part of research infrastructure. That has always been the domain of these digital learning platforms. And student information systems have never really been a place for experimentation. We're starting. With AIR, we're starting to build a random assignment of product functionality. With assistments, we are treating Infinite Campus as a lab notebook, but assistments deals with the randomization. Um, and we are building towards identifying quasi-experimental conditions within the existing data so that we can so that uh, we can build towards the idea of RCTs but use the existing data or the quasi-experimental condition style data uh, as it exists today. Uh, all right you can you can reach me now uh, and also uh, LinkedIn, my website, my corporate website. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Janessa. Thank you Daniel. That was really that was really interesting. Uh, you know, something that, that you said that really stood out to me was that, that we shouldn't be um, asking researchers to constantly be reinventing the wheel when it comes to educational research. And it looks like you're really doing a lot toward that end. It's really, really inspiring. This is exciting stuff. Yeah. I appreciate it. 
Well, and yeah. thanks, to, thanks to everyone for attending. I'm, I'm very curious to get to the questions. What's up? Yeah, so um, the first question I'll address here is from, uh, let's see, this is Addison Laye Adiola here? He asked a question in advance that I think is pretty interesting. Addison Laye? Okay, so he asked, um, how did how do you go about getting early adopters and what kind of unique challenges did you face in implementing a research platform? That early adopters question is an interesting one, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's uh, that's a very good question. So one of the one of the techniques that we used was going to funders first and specifically going to the style of funder that is not traditional government. Um, funding. As much as I love NSF and IES, they have a very particular way of doing review. Uh, and pitching something to them that hasn't been done before doesn't always succeed. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they tend to like things that are already completely proven out, which is unfortunate. What we found is that private philanthropies such as Schmidt Futures uh, or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been much more responsive to this idea of innovative research infrastructure. I would also say that the especially like education research has the funding for it has always focused on specific research questions and or you know there's a new intervention let's see if it works. What, when we come uh, to them and we say, well, we want to build reproducible infrastructure that will cut down on the cost of research for everyone and make things more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. That's a good pitch, but it doesn't fit squarely into the pay for intervention research style funding. And so frankly, it's just taken a little while to keep talking with the funders to say, this is like you should be investing in things that are either directly infrastructure or near to infrastructure so that um well actually the gates foundation's way of talking about this has been really good they talk about it as enabling conditions that they want to fund new enabling conditions for later research where there's proof that these enabling conditions have made things faster cheaper, uh, better for education researchers or practitioners or students. Um, and that has been a useful frame. All right. We've also found that starting with the funders allows us to find mission aligned researchers through the funders networks, because we as a company uh, I think very reasonably are going to be looked at with a little bit of suspicion by you know anyone in the research community who is wondering why is a for-profit company doing this like you know what's it in it for them that's a really good question to ask and so making sure that we build the relationship with the funders first allows uh, you know if we are successful at that that means that the funders can identify for us researchers who are much more likely to want to do this style of work. Uh, yeah, let, let's do the next question. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting um, point that you make that that people are suspicious. What's in it for them? Yep. Yeah, that I'm sure that that's pretty common in a lot of platforms as well that are trying to do research. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, <clears throat> There is another question here. Um, let's see. Is um, Jane Shore here? And also, please um, ask your questions in the chat if you'd like to um, ask your question. And don't worry if you prefer not to speak on camera. I'm happy to read it for you. <laughs> Just say that in the chat. Um, Jane Shore, are you here? Would you like to ask your question, or I can read it for you? Okay, so Jane Shore asks, what elements of your research have not worked at scale? That's great. Okay. One of the challenges that we saw right away is that education data is localized both in the, the, the physical location, like different data owners, different databases, that sort of thing. But education data is also localized 
uh, in terms of data values in the in the state, like by state or by uh, jurisdiction, like uh, like LEA. And so, what we found is that we might have a good idea about how to compare uh, context interventions or you know and outcomes across districts. But it, the data just might not support it, or it might be localized in such a way that it's really hard to compare uh, one value to another. One of the ways that we have gotten at that is is uh, to find to sometimes mandate that data be uh, standardized. So uh, attendance is a good example here. We built uh, an attendance abstraction in our database that allows for local definitions of attendance values for types of tardy or types of you know unexcused absence and that that's good you have to have that but we require that our customers map those values to an infinite campus centralized data dictionary that is really simple it's just you know excused unexcused tardy absent present that's it and that allows us to write a single query that returns comparable results across those districts but other times that's just not available and we have to use either automated or manual matching to try to get at that sort of capability for our early warning system the outcome of interest had to do with enrollment outcomes like uh, dropping out or not and that is state localized and so for that value we did a manual labeling uh, to say for every attendance outcome code in the entire country we mapped them to an another common data dictionary that we maintain so that we could see the difference in out in enrollment patterns across state lines it just took a lot of work yeah it does sound like a lot of work but that's that's incredible that you made that sort of standardization that that makes a lot of sense wow that's great okay um so we have another question here um ashish agarwal are you present Okay, I'll read this for you. <laughs> um, it says, uh, can we integrate any data analysis or research tools directly with current LMS systems like Canvas? Oh yeah, good question. Okay, so uh, the answer to that is both yes and no. The no part is easy uh, because when we build technology, we're building infinite campus technology where researchers would, I say, log into our platform, our customers log into our platform, data is being managed with an infinite campus. Uh, so it's not like we're making software that could be plugged into another LMS. Uh, however, the yes part of that is that we care very deeply about student data interoperability. We are one of the leading members of IMS Global Learning Consortium, which uh, is one of the key standards bodies for interoperability protocols. And we want to be one of the first K-12 SISs or LMSs to implement those protocols. And so when you're talking about things like, like Canvas, uh, we do integrate with Canvas. We, we do integrate with Schoology, you know, for instance, one of our key competitors. And we do so through these interoperability protocols because it's in the best interest of our customers. So um, for instance, if if and when we do research with someone like Neil and Christina Heffernan at Assessments, they need to operate their own uh, digital learning platform. And they want to integrate it with Google Classroom, with Infinite Campus, with Schoology, with you know, whomever. And they should be able to do that. So the way that we integrate with them is through these interoperability protocols. So that, for instance, with an LTI launch, someone who's authenticated as a user on Infinite Campus can launch into assistments, do whatever they need to do there. And then some data is being pushed back into Infinite Campus, uh, say a, a, a gradebook item. That's a pretty common one. So that's a that's an important way to link these two systems. Um, it's not; it doesn't get quite at what you're you're going at there, but I think it's it's important to bring up. Those LTI links are a really a really innovative and important piece of the puzzle. I think um, that's great that you're that you're working with that. And uh, you know, I um I I wonder about those um, 
I don't know as much about that interoperability protocol. Um, is there, is the privacy protection for those done on your end, or is that, and you know, is that within the the, the transfer protocol that the privacy is protected, or both? Um, the usually those links, if it, if it's LTI. Um, those usually pass individual students between systems, and the school district would have had to have a data use agreement with all parties. So not just Infinite Campus, but assistments, for instance, or any of the other systems. Uh, so the school would have already agreed uh, that a particular set of data was going to be passed to the other digital learning platform. And what we had to build was toggles to say, that you know, at a, an administrator at one of our customer districts has to log into Infinite Campus, go to the settings, and say yes, it's okay for Infinite Campus to transfer data through LTI to this third-party system, and it's okay to receive information from them and put it in the teacher gradebook. The school district can revoke that at any time, uh, so there's technical protections, and of course, in order to do that in the first place, they should have a, their own legal agreement with the vendors. Great. Well, it looks like we have time for maybe just uh, one more question. And uh, this is this was something that somebody mentioned ahead of time. It's not exactly a question, but I'm actually quite curious about this. Um, somebody asked about um, how this this type of system could be extrapolated for use in. They asked about the Indian subcontinent, but my question is 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 internationally. You talked quite a bit about using state and federal data. Um, and I know that that's, that's probably not the focus of your organization to do this internationally, or at least not yet. But do you have any ideas about how this could be um, created for use in, in other countries and what that would take? Yeah, so I think the rest of the world is both farther ahead than we are in some meaningful ways and behind. The ways in which they're ahead tend to do with the way their education systems are structured. Most of the rest of the world uses nationalized education systems. It's not federal like we have. And so education data is often already in one place at a national level. And so you can do this sort of instrumenting systems for research just in one place. And you don't have to worry about often all this cross fender stuff or getting information between education agencies. Um, you know, I was talking with um, economist Chris Nielsen from Princeton, and he does a lot of work down in, in Chile and Latin America specifically. And um, it, he said it's just a lot easier to do a national intervention and evaluate it because you just need one department of education to say, yep, let's do it. And then the data is there. Okay, so that's the that's the benefit. On the downside, um, that does not mean that these education departments have actually invested in modern data technologies. Uh, it takes money and it takes expertise, and you, you never you can't quite predict who is going to have invested in this sort of thing. Like, apparently Chile is doing really well, but there are plenty of other countries who just simply have a lot less technology, and so. Um, yeah, I've seen the World Bank, I've seen the Inter-American Development B Bank try to push funding for this sort of uh, system, but, but frankly, there's a little bit of reticence to give money to a for-profit company, again, reasonably. Uh, they prefer to create more open standards, uh, the, the World Bank especially, and then let vendors or let individual uh, governments try to ad adopt those standards, like the United Nations has something like that. I, I just don't know that creating one more set of standards is going to be quick enough. I think that there needs to be some robust investment in whether it's not for profit or for for profit direct infrastructure building. All right, right, that makes sense. You're talking about the lowest common denominator reporting earlier, and it sounds like that's the same the same problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, we've reached the end of our time here. So I think we'll uh, wrap it up here. Um, thank you so much for joining us and for your interest in this topic. And a special thanks to Daniel for sharing your expertise. This was great. 
Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, and thanks Janessa and Ulrich and the entire learning agency crew for having me. It was great. We will share this video with the learning engineering community. Um, feel free to reach to send this out to colleagues who might be interested in learning about this um, who weren't able to make it today. Um, we'll also circulate answers to the main questions addressed on the call. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My name is Janessa, spelled J-E-N-E-S-S-A, -S at the Learning Agency, Janessa at the Learning Agency.com. Um, so thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>